For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mudli. Researcher and analyst, Professor Raymond Satner, joins me to discuss collective decisions and debate. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Since you wrote your article, the question of collective action has come under great scrutiny. Um, following Tabu Mbeki's suggestion that MPs do not represent their parties, but the citizens of the country. Yes, you know, it's interesting because I have always understood that MPs were there because of the ANC or their party, and that they had to abide by the caucus decision. And that was what we all understood at the time of Mandela and the time of Mbeki. And in fact, uh, some uh, members, of the members of the leadership have on occasion had to apologize for some things that they said because uh, the collective disagreed with that and made, have had to make public apologies. But when I was in Parliament, it was very, very clear that you had this caucus and it wasn't even the ANC National Executive, it was ministers sometimes coming there saying this is the legislation and there was no way really where there was a proper debate. It was colle allegedly collective, but in fact uh, you were really told what you were supposed to do. But even if there had been debate, once the caucus decides something, you had to go and do it. But if the national executive had sent a message to the effect that this, that, and the other had to be done, that was really what had to be done. But it's also seen, the evidence of this is also seen by the fact that the uh, national executive tends to nominate leading figures in parliament. So it's a new thing, but I think what Mbeki is saying, which complicates matters for the ANC, uh, or let's say for thinking about this question, even if he'd held by that position earlier, which he doesn't say that he did, um, but even if he had, uh, the truth of the matter is that in the light of the Constitutional Court judgment in Kandla, it was made very clear that you have obligations beyond that to the party to which you belong. And even if the party to which you belong believes that, he didn't say this, that the president um, must stay, if the public in general, whom you are really representing in the broadest sense, Becky was saying, well then you can't ignore that. You really have to mediate that relationship between belonging to a party and uh, representing the people of South Africa through your oath of office and through the constitution. So that creates a, a complication because uh, they are going to vote. It was supposed to be this week, but it's been postponed because uh, uh, they have gone to the Constitutional Court over whether there can be a secret ballot. Now, the Constitutional Court is likely to decide that uh, there can be a secret ballot because if you look at the regulations that um, Neil Coleman of Corsati put this on Twitter and I was said they haven't catered for the, the Neil, fa Neil Coleman factor because he's very, he, he and some other people are very um, good at finding these things and very determined to explain it. So he got this regulation which makes it clear that the speaker is free to allow, uh, it doesn't say that must be by secret ballot, but I think that it will be subject to the majority approving it. And we don't know what is going to happen between then, now and when that happens. Uh, it is very unusual, for reasons that I've explained earlier, for ANC MPs to even consider voting contrary to what their leadership has said. But we are living in a situation at the moment where there's a lot of flux. And it may be, it's not impossible that ANC MPs either openly 
or by voting for a secret ballot. Once you vote for a secret ballot, uh, and the, and that is um, agreed, that gives an indication that the majority are going to vote for a vote of no confidence. But I I wouldn't like to put a bet. My guess is that it's not going to happen. That somehow Zuma is going to survive. Uh, but um, my lima was very interesting at the little snippet I heard at the at Church Square, I think it was. He said, to the ANC MPs, I want to say, we know you are cow cowards. We work with you all the time. We know you are cowards. But General Holomisa has got a plan to get you covered, to have a secret ballot. So not even your mothers will know how you voted. So um, there's a sort of, these people must be sensing that people are viewing them with contempt. So that's another reason, factor which may lead them to decide to actually vote in favor of a motion of no confidence or a, vote, or a secret ballot. But if the ANC caucus and the ANC NEC has told them to vote for um, a secret ballot, it's a break with what they've done up till now. I don't know what's going to happen. You speak of the ANC disintegrating, but you don't elaborate. Yes, you know, it's interesting to when, when a, a party has <coughs> over 60% of the vote, it's unusual to say that they are disintegrating. Um, when they run the government, how are they disintegrating? We do have indications that this, even at an electoral level, with the uh, local government elections last year, where the ANC actually uh, failed to get a majority of the votes in, in key areas of the country, so that th the signs of the ANC I disintegrating electorally are actually beginning to show. They were showing before this. There's a number of electoral studies that show that the ANC was getting a lower percentage of the vote uh, in 2009 compared with 2004 and so forth. Um, but there are other ways that you can speak of an organization disintegrating by asking how is it held together. When I was involved we joined because we believed in certain ideas. The apartheid regime stood for oppression. The ANC stood for liberation, freedom, emancipation, a life with dignity. And that was what held us together. Now, you can use all those words, but what do they mean? And we would have lots of debates. Now, there are no debates at the moment. and. Um, you have this word radical economic transformation, but it's real, uh, and the way people understand it is it's a way of looting. And um, we really need to ask ourselves, if the ANC exists, does it exist as a vibrant organization? My answer is that it is no longer vibrant and that we are seeing signs of disintegration. There were times when people really loved the ANC and now some of those people are marching against the ANC. Um, now, I don't know what the situation is in some of the deep rural areas, so it may be different. It may be that those people who have been in the ANC for decades have a different view but many of us who were in the ANC for decades have decided that the ANC is no longer a vehicle for liberation. I think there's a sort of um, uh, decadent way in which the ANC is conducting itself when it has a Chris Harney Memorial Lecture and they get Gigaba to deliver it. Now, how can Gigaba represent what Chris Haney stood for and what did he say that bears any insight into the messages of Chris Haney's life and the way in which ver the various commemorations have been handled doesn't seem to show respect for that memory amongst other things and I think the legacies are very important how you interpret the legacies of Tumble, Mandela 
most of the time they're empty. And I think that an organization that is alive uh, uses those as teaching tools. An organization that is dying just uses them as a ritual. And I think what is remaining of the ANC is the ritual of saying ANC lives, ANC leads, and both living and leading are open to question. Thank you, Professor. That was Professor Raymond Sattner speaking to Creamer Media's policy about collective decisions and debates.